Sorry, I'm just taking that from my wife. This is my wife, by the way, if you don't know. Her name's Jen and my name's Bates. So sorry we didn't introduce ourselves earlier. <laughs> this is Felicity Quinn, and she's very cute trying to have a nap. <laughs> yeah. Um, so guys, on the Easter weekend, we had the most amazing student camp um, up in Sutherland. Anybody want to hold a baby? <laughs> yeah, we had the most amazing student camp, and there is a clip that we're going to show now to um, yeah, let you know what we did. I used to hate the Bible. When people used to talk to me about the Bible, it was like, forget it, man. God is like my light now. I was in the dark, but in this darkness, God is like my light. And I can smile. I can smile. I know it's not easy, but I want to follow you, Jesus. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. a massive privilege to see how God works on camps like these. My personal highlight was watching all of the baptisms, but specifically Sarah baptizing her little sister, Joanna, 
which was really special for me. It reminded of me when my sister baptized me on a camp very similar to that very, very many years ago. Um, and our, our eldest boy's highlight was the chicken coop, definitely. <laughs> Amazing. Who doesn't want to be a student after watching that, right? And coming on student camp was amazing. So cool. That guy was singing that song there, Godfrey, from Josh Jane. He came and served us with worship the whole weekend. So just awesome to see churches working together. Uh, then you'll know God's been very kind to us in blessing us with a house in Die Boot. And we're busy renovating that. That's going to become an amazing welcoming space for our town to come and encounter Jesus in different ways through different spaces. So I just want to watch a quick up update on how that's going. Hi One Hope, it's Jen. I've been working with the design and building teams renovating the One Hope house for the past few weeks and it has been such an exciting project. The builders have broken out the inside walls downstairs and added a window or two and it's been amazing to see how the space has opened up. We are busy choosing paint colours and lights and very soon it's going to start looking and feeling like home. It has sparked such excitement and anticipation in my heart for how God is going to use this space for His glory. We've already had our monthly prayer meeting here and started to imagine how the Houghtons will enjoy this space and use it to grow friendships, to grow as a family and build community here for years to come. And then just to show you that there is no way to get in the front door because it's behind what looks like a haystack. So that's where the front door is. The new roof is almost finished and is looking like it has always been here. The staff just moved into the upstairs office and are so happy to be back together in the same place again. The meeting space is also changing fast. We've bricked up some of the roller doors, added new windows, and are in the process of adding another door. We've also removed the pillars to open up the space. The young adults have already met here, and we can't wait to start using this space for life groups, alpha, youth, and so much more. Just imagine how many lives are going to meet and fall more in love with Jesus here. There's still lots to do, but we can't wait to welcome you here soon. Charlie for putting those videos together. Awesome. Uncle Charlie, where are you? Oh, he's behind the camera. Would you have believe it? Yeah. Can we give him a round of applause? Just does such a great job. One of the things we really value is just all hands on deck. And Charlie, you've been all hands on deck, serving us with media for the past uh, few years. So just, oh, for, yeah, while well, we're in a lockdown. So just love that. Thanks so much, bro. And then something we also really value is proclaiming the gospel to our town. And um, what we're trying to do here as One Hope is be filled with the hope and life of Christ, that's when we're together like this, and then take that and fill our town with the hope and life of Christ. And so that's what we do through something called Alpha. You guys all know it. You've heard it over and over again. Uh, you like what I did there, guys, for those of you know. There we go. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> anyway, you'll get, we'll be in on that one soon. Um, so what I'd love us to do is to just stand together now. We're going to be launching this coming week. It's the Alpha launch. What that is, invite friends who don't know Christ, who are looking in, who may be skeptical, who are considering Jesus, who are like, I'm not convinced, but just want to check it out. There is no better platform that I know of than Alpha to just have open, honest conversations about things that matter in life, specifically faith. So can we stand together in, in groups of twos and threes? I'm going to ask you to pray in your small groups for specific people who are in your life who aren't yet followers of Jesus and just lift them up to him and maybe just maybe straight after this morning you need to pop them an invite and just say hey do you want to come join us this coming week even tomorrow for the alpha launch it's just a video you watch non-threatening not all in but once you've watched it obviously guys can then sign up for the 10-week course can we stand now and do that uh, just for two or three minutes pray for those people who you um trusting that Jesus would meet with them
Jesus, we know that we can't change anybody. We can't convince anybody of the truth of who you are and how good you are, but we know you can. And so as we pray now and as we've lifted these prayers before, we, before you, Lord, we know that you are going to work and you are at work in our hearts and the hearts of our friends and our family. And Jesus, would you give us courage and boldness to make invites as we need to those who need to come and check out this Alpha course, Father, and start a journey of really uh, investigating who you are in Jesus' name. Amen. So guys, all the details are there on the screen and on our website and our newsletter, etc. Just to set you at ease, we've got experienced hosts and helpers in our alpha groups. These guys have done it many times and um, it's, probably one of, it's probably the least threatening environment you can invite any of your friends into who don't know Jesus. And they will just have this wonderful experience of getting to chat about faith, etc. And online, yeah, sorry, is online there as well. Um, Clive, you are you. Can I hand over to you? Clive's going to read the scripture for us and pray this morning and then hand over to Paul. Morning. Um, I'm good, thanks, Paul. Um, <laughs> uh, can I ask that we actually start off uh, in prayer? Can we just bow our heads together? Hello, our wonderful Father. Oh, this is such a privilege to be here together to be with you, and to know that you've promised us that you'll never leave us nor forsake us, and yet when we gather like this, there's a special blessing. What a privilege, a special blessing. Your Holy Spirit, you're right here. Father, I just pray that you would touch every person in this congregation this morning, Lord, that you would prepare their hearts. You're going to, we're going to hear your word, Lord, your beautiful word. We know that the word is life, it is Jesus, and Lord, we know that, Jesus, you taught us that the word's effectiveness is dependent in part on where our hearts are. In the parable of the sower, you taught us, Lord, that depending on how the soil is, the, the, suit, the seed of your, your word will take root and will produce much fruit, Lord. So this morning, we pray that each of us will prepare our hearts, Lord, that we will Surrender to you, Lord, that we will say in our hearts, in, in each of our hearts and minds, that we will say, come, Lord, have your way in us. Let your word transform us, Lord. Let our minds be renewed by your word this morning, Lord. Thank you for the privilege of walking with you every day. And Lord, we just thank you for your word, which we open our hearts to now. And Lord, we also just pray for Paul as he comes to preach. Thank you that you've anointed him, that you've blessed him, and that his words will be your words this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're reading out of uh, Genesis. Um, it's uh, right at the beginning, uh, chapter 1, and we're going to read verse 1 to 5, and then we're going to jump over to uh, verse 26 and read parts out of there. Okay, I'm reading from the uh, English Standard Version, the ESV. The chapter is entitled, The Creation of the World. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. Verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it. We're going to jump to verse 31. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Talk about an understatement. And there was evening, and there was morning, and the sixth day. Amen, Lord. Thanks, Paulie. Thanks, Clavi. So he calls me Paulie. I call him Clavi. We live next door to each other, or very close to each other. Thanks, bro. Isn't this so precious? Isn't it just so precious to be back together again, sitting, singing just this morning, just, I actually it was parts I just didn't want to sing, I just wanted to listen to you, 
I just wanted to hear the voices behind me just, just singing the name of Jesus. It's so precious. So precious to come and to serve together again. So precious to see Jordan Nell and his parents sitting over there. It's so good to have you. I heard about someone called Rebecca this morning. I don't know who Rebecca is, but Rebecca, it's the first time she's been here. She was on setup and she had to pick up dog poo. Is that true? <laughs> the first time that she's come to our church. I love that. I love that Silva, whose short little testimony was on the student camp. As far as I know, he's the newest believer in our midst. Two weeks old in the Lord Jesus. And he's here somewhere at the back over there. Silva, praise Jesus for your salvation. Father, we ask that there'd be so many more sons and daughters coming home through us, guys, through the Holy Spirit at work in us, but us inviting and us encouraging and us saying, hey, let me show you what Jesus is doing in my life or in my career or in Alpha or come to church or so many different ways. This is precious and it's good to be together. Um, before I digress too far, I'm going to share this morning, I'm going to be speaking on returning to the true story. And I just have such a sense in my heart, I'm going to be speaking on it for the next three weeks probably, or this week and another two, and I have such a sense in my heart of the Spirit speaking around wanting to come and do healing in people's hearts. Like true healing, where you've believed false stories over your life, and we're going to speak about that a little bit this morning, but I want to do a big overview, but just false stories from your family, things that your mom and dad have spoken over you, things that the culture, I mean, we're swimming in the culture Things that the culture are constantly speaking over us. All these false narratives. And the, the Bible comes and the Father comes and Jesus comes and says, I am the truth. I proclaim a true story, a new story over your lives. And that's what we're going to be talking about. But I just want to stir in our hearts something of, a, of an expectation that we're, if we're hurting, and we all are, but I mean, there's, there's some of you in the room who are desperate there's some who just feel like their lives are chaos. I really felt as I was preparing that there are some who are contemplating suicide. Here in our midst this morning, you look around and you say, oh, you all look fine. Well, we all look fine to one another. But inside there's things going on in people's hearts that we do not know. And I just believe that the Father wants to speak over you in the next few weeks a true story. His story. And so we're going to be talking about that out of Genesis this morning. And so I guess the first question to ask when we say that there is a true story is, well, what is truth? Is there a true story? You raise the, the, the concept of a, of a truth at a bri or at any social gathering, and, and I mean, you'll have what I would call an interesting conversation, right? Someone's going to scorn you. Like, surely, surely you don't believe that in the 21st century. Surely we've gone past that. Someone's going to laugh at you. You must be joking. And more than likely, someone's going to be offended by you. Right? How dare you? How dare you say that you hold the one truth and I hold an untruth? How dare you? And there's this offense. Well, one of the most profound and eternally significant statements or questions of the Bible was actually from a man who didn't believe in Jesus, an unbelieving person, and his name was Pilate. And he was the one who was presiding over the trial of Jesus just before his crucifixion. And Jesus says to him, he says, I have come into the world to testify to the truth. And Pilate says, what is truth? In a, he wasn't asking Jesus for an answer. It was a cynical response to Jesus saying, I have come into the world to testify to truth. And I don't know about in your world, but... 2,000 years later, it feels to me like the whole world breathes Pilate's cynicism. What is truth? How dare you say you hold truth? Well, guys, I'm here to remind us this morning that the Old Testament that we cherish, that it calls the Almighty the God of truth. That's his, one of his names, the God of truth. Then we turn to Jesus in the Gospels, and we see Jesus coming, and He proclaims, I am the truth. It's me. You come to the Father through me. I'm literally the embodiment of truth. We see God's Word always speaking about God's Word is truth. And so this morning when I say that we're returning to the true story, this is the story we want to return to, to the God of truth, to Jesus saying, I am the truth, to God's word saying, it is the truth. So we're going to start at the very beginning in Genesis, 
And I'm going to make five simple, simple points this morning. And the first one is this. I have a creator. I want you just to think about that statement. I have a creator. What are the implications? It means that you have someone who knows how you work. It means that you and I have someone who didn't just design us, but understands how and why we were designed, what we need, how we feel loved. Someone who knows what it takes to make me as a person flourish, who knows what it takes to make my family flourish, and who also knows what breaks us and what destroys us. This is what you need to see from Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created. The earth was without form, and darkness was over the face of the the deep, but the Spirit of God was hovering there, right there in the midst of that. And God said, let there be light, and God saw that the light, and God separated, and God called. God was there. We have a Creator. His name is God. It's not a discussion this morning on how He created, but I just want to get across to us how critical it is that we believe that we have a creator, a designer, an originator of life. And so because He is those things, because He's our creator, our designer, our originator, He knows how we function. He knows what life is supposed to look like. One of my favorite psalms, 139, famous psalm, Psalm of David. Read it in the NLT this morning. Just a, such a fresh lens. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed. Listen to the intimacy of this language. In utter seclusion. And I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment, including the one you're sitting in right now this morning, was laid out before a single day had passed. Not just there at creation, not just there in the design as I'm being knit together in my mother's womb, but every day planned out, purposed, created for purpose. Now, why, why is this so important? Well, because we live steeped in false stories. Guys, I could go on and on. You could go on and on about the false stories of our lives. Think about the cultural stories. Think about how much our culture is telling us and telling our children. That is not the story of Scripture. Relativism, Think of, think of the family stories that have been spoken over you. You know, you will never amount to, or you always, or you never, or I should have done this myself if I wanted it done properly. These are family narratives, false lies that are spoken over us from those that we love. And they cut some of the deepest cuts into our hearts. Think about false stories about God. There's millions of people who will give you a completely different version of who God is. They can't all be true. False stories. Think about the false stories in our wounded selves. The Marys in the room. We, we know each other that we're married to the, the best out of anybody. Think about the, the wounds that we don't just inflict on one another, but that we come into the marriage carrying. So many false stories. And truly believing, this is still the first point, that we have a creator. Truly believing that we have a creator gives him room to come in and say, I can speak a true story over your life. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that incredibly redeeming in the midst of what we face? To say, this is another way of saying it, to say that God is our creator is to say that he holds the true operating manual for my life. He actually knows how I work and so the implication obviously, is that I turn to him and say, help, help me. It doesn't look like I know what I'm doing. Help. The second thing is this. So the first one is, I have a creator. Genesis 1, God created. God said. God saw. It was good. The second one is this. My creator turns chaos to order, darkness 
to light. The earth was without form and void, says verse 2, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. Can you just imagine this churning world of water, formless, voidless, terrifying, actually. Think about pitch black, this deep, deep water, this formless place, and God is hovering, and boom, God speaks, and this churning world is suddenly full of light for the first time, full of life, full of order, and the chaos has been dispelled, and the darkness has been dispelled. First thing is I have a creator. The second thing is that my creator turns chaos to order, darkness to light. The third thing is this. My creator's changes are very good. Very good. God didn't just bring order. Look at verse 10. God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together. He called seas. And God saw that it was good. And then you see it again in verse 12. It was good. Verse 18, it was good. Verse 21, it was good. Are you getting it? It was good. It was good. And then the verse 31. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. Friends, some of you need to hear that this morning about you. Seriously. Some of us need to hear this morning. I was praying just now up in that field. I just felt the Holy Spirit whispering to me the words out of Job, where Job is cursing the day that he is born. Where he's like, I wish my life had never happened. And it felt like a spirit was saying to me, there's some here this morning with that thought in your hearts. I curse the day I was born. I wish I never came into this world. My, this would have been easier. My family would have been better off without me. My whatever it is, whatever the lie is that the devil is speaking over you, the Father wants to come over and speak to you today out of verse 31 of the book of Genesis, chapter 1. And he wants to say, he looks at everything that he has made and he says, very good. The delight in those words, it's just like, Clive said, I don't know how you said it just now, but you're just, I think, the understatement of the century. Very good. I wonder if anyone in the room this morning needs chaos turned to order. I wonder if anyone in the room this morning is thinking about a sin issue in your life, an addiction in your life, something going on in your life, a brokenness in your life, and saying, God, could you, could you come? I'm aching for someone to come and change this chaos into order, to take this darkness that just feels so all-penetrating and impossible to shift, and to speak, let there be light. And boom, in our lives, God's light, the light of the gospel breaks in. Anybody aching? For some of that, maybe you don't know Jesus, and maybe you're desperately aching, and you say, Paul, are you, this sounds like water to, to, to me, and I'm thirsty. This sounds like food, and I'm hungry. Or maybe even you do know Jesus, and yet still we struggle, right? Still we battle our addictions and our, our problems and the false stories that we swallow. How many times do we, do we stop and realize that this, this revelation that God had given us, we've forgotten? And it's a year later or two years later and we suddenly realize, oh yes, God told me that, but I, I forgot. And we need this true story spoken over us again and again. So why is there the false story? Why is there all this aching and pain and chaos in our lives? Guys, it's because God created and said, very good. And then something terrible happened. Something terrible happened. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. You'll, if you've been around church for a little while or in a Christian family, you'll know Genesis chapter 3 and we call it the fall. Now the serpent was more crafty, this is verse 1, than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say... You shall not eat of any tree in the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, who's obviously the devil, the evil one, the tempter, 
We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, let me ask you a little question here, congregation, this morning. That's right. Sorry, Ella. (laughs) Let me ask you a question. What happens in this passage? Tell me three things that the devil does in Eve's mind in this passage. Can you see them? Someone shout out the first one for me. What what does he introduce about God in this passage? What's that doubt? Where do you see that? Right? Did God actually say? Wow, who resonates with this part of Scripture? I do. A week after God told me to do something and I still haven't done it, and I'm thinking, oh, this is costly. Oh, this is going to be embarrassing. Oh, this is so far out of my comfort zone. I'm sure God didn't really say that. And on our, we, have this, we have this, did God really say? Really? Sell your car? Give away the money? Give your car to somebody? Give your guitar away, please, Lord, anything but my guitar. (laughs) Costly, not financial. Take your time, you busy businessman, you busy businesswoman, you housewife with little kids. Your life is run ragged at the moment. You feel like you have no time and God is saying, I want you to invest in so-and-so and in this person. And it's going to take coffee dates. It's going to take evenings. It's going to take time. God... Did God really say, shouldn't I be wise? Shouldn't I be a good steward of my time? Anyone? Just me? (laughs) I have one amen at the back. (laughs) What's the second thing the devil does in this passage to Eve? Convinces her, yes, but I'm thinking specifically around what he does about God. What does he say about God in this passage? Josh, you look like you've got it. No? (laughs) No? Exactly. You have got it, but it's just like Sunday school all over again. Who's got a sweet? Is there like a, like a marshmallow or something? He calls God a liar. Because Eve says, God says that if we eat from this tree, we're going to die. What does the devil say? You will not surely die. God's a liar. That's what he says. And what's the third thing that he says? You should have the scripture up there. What is, he, what is he questioning here in verse 5? For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. What I take from that is the devil is questioning the motives of God. Cynicism. He's saying to Eve, right? He's saying to Eve, Eve, God, first of all, you won't die. God's lying. And secondly, the reason that God doesn't want you to do this is because God doesn't want you to be like Him. He's trying to stop your fun. He's trying to ruin your life. He's trying to not have you be like Him. And you should be like Him. This is what's going on in this moment. And guys, in this moment with Eve, something cosmic and of eternal ramifications happen. The false story. Here's the false story. Adam and Eve ate this fruit or whatever it, it was. Apple, orange, who knows? Avocado, as Stephanus and, and, Stel- and uh, Nugent is always saying. This is what they were actually doing. They were declaring, we no longer believe God. We don't believe that what he says is true. We believe the devil, the servant. We believe the serpent. We believe ourselves over God. We will self-determine. We have the truth. We don't trust the motives of God. We don't trust the heart of God. God is a liar. We will self-determine. And in that moment, they are saying to God, we don't want your true story. Thank you very much. We want our story. Isn't that so deeply tragic? Why, why, why would we do this? Why do we do this? Because this is not Adam and Eve. This is Romans 8, right? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This is not a them thing. This is an us. 
thing. Say, turn to the person next to you and say, you're a filthy sinner. <laughs> and then, then you can say to them, covered by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for the gospel. <laughs> right? But this is so key for us to grasp, guys. Why? Why? Because if we just think it's a bad story and it's terrible and we've just got to avoid it, we, all we do is end up being moralistic and in behavior and trying not to sleep with our girlfriend or our boyfriend or take drugs or get drunk. Right? If we, if we don't get it, if we just think that's like another story, we need to understand why Eve swallowed this hook, line, and sinker. Why was it so appealing? Look at verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, it was good, and it was delightful to the eyes. How many men and women have fallen to things that are delightful to the eyes? And that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. Think about what the world is telling us right now about the wisdom that we hold. Corinthians, foolishness. The gospel is foolishness. Powerless. This is what Corinthians says, where Paul is saying, he says the, 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 the Jews, they hold up the gospel and they say it's powerless. We're not looking for a Savior who's died on a cross. That's not our Savior. We're waiting for the Savior who's going to bring Israel into, into might, military might. That's what we're waiting for. Who's this? This is powerless. This can't be the good news. This can't be the gospel. And it says the Gentiles, or the philosophers, were seeking wisdom. And they were like, this is stupid. The God who came to earth lets himself be killed? Are you, are you for real? What kind of gospel is that? Do you get it? Foolishness. And the world is doing the same thing. And they're saying it right here back to Eve. She saw that the tree was good for wisdom. False story. Wisdom. Are you still with me? I'm going a bit slow, but I'm just so excited to be back with you. Not looking at a camera, so you've got to just forgive me. She took of its fruit and ate, and also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And in that moment, Adam and Eve say, Nah, I think there's something better. Let's try this. Let's try this. Let's look, look at how pleasing this is for the eye. This is what I need. This is what I really need. And we choose false stories because we want life to the full. We want to live fully human. Every single one of us have these desires. And so we have this, this thought in our hearts. If we could just make enough money, dot, 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 then. False story. Everybody must like me. False story. It might even be honorable things that like injustice. Like we look at injustice and we say, if I could just make an impact big enough in the world, then I would be fulfilled. Then I would be satisfied. False story. Maybe it's you and your singleness here today. And you think, if I could just find a girlfriend or boyfriend, if I could just get married, or if you're married, if I just hadn't got married and I was still single, or if I had a different wife, or I had a different husband, or we had different children. And there's this constant search for this other story. Guys, this is the crazy, the crazy part is that the fall comes and it breaks trust in God. This is the tragedy of the fall. We no longer look to God and say, we love your story. It's very good. You're our creator. Instead, we go, we don't trust you anymore. We want to find our own story. We want to make our own tracks. We're going to take the train which you have placed so beautifully in the creation story and said, this will make you flourish. This will give you a beautiful life. And we're going to go, hey, hang on. I'm building my tracks that way, thank you. Through the Namibian desert. We're going to go there with Petey. Right? And off we go on our tracks. And everything since that moment until this moment has been man misaligning himself with God. Constantly we're misaligning ourselves with God. But thank God that's not the end of the story. Thank you, Jesus. Guys, do you know that there's the, the, the marvel of the gospel, the marvel of what God has done for us, is that in this Genesis moment, God didn't go... 
done my bit, created everything perfect, created it very good, gave you everything you needed for life and wholeness and flourishing. And in months, years, who knows how long that period was, you've thrown it all away. You're on your own, suckers. Imagine if God had done that. Instead, right in this moment, look at Genesis 3, verse 8. What does God do? What does God do right after they have betrayed Him in the most dreadful way and believed the serpent? God comes down. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man and said to him, Where are you? Most redeeming words. Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree in which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, the woman whom you gave to me, and we know the rest. I just wanted to read that last little bit there. <laughs> I'm missing Sarah Lloyd today. She's, she's in, where's she gone? To see Victoria and where they live again? Sedgefield, that's right. Let me ask you a question. Did God not know where they were? The God of all universe, the one who created with a spoken word, had he lost Adam and Eve? Why does God come down and ask this question? Where are you? Another question. Did God not know what they had done? But he asks them, have you eaten from the tree? What's he, what's he doing in this moment? God is, God is displaying the most incredible divine grace and love. And scriptures show us again and again that it's man who is hiding and God who is seeking. It's God who is coming again and again and saying, Where are you? Have you sinned? Where are you? And God is saying this over and over our lives. I want to speak to you, especially this morning, if you don't follow Jesus Christ. If you hear, and I hope there's some people here who do not follow Jesus, and I hope I didn't make you terribly awkward just now when someone called you a filthy, rotten sinner. Uh, that's, that's not great. I shouldn't do that, right? But I want, to, I want to ask you, does God not know where you are this morning? Doesn't God know exactly where you are? Doesn't God know, let me extend it a little bit, the places that you've been? Places that you'd be so ashamed to stand up. And I'm not just talking physical places. I'm talking about places in our minds, places in our hearts, places in our desires. Uh, we, some of us would be, all of us would be so ashamed to stand up and say, this is the place that I've been driven to or that I've willingly walked into or the place that I hide. Where's your tree in the garden? Where do you hide from God? What is it that you're hiding under your philosophy or your intellectualization and you're desperate for God, but you want, to, you want to keep all standoffish and look intellectual, right? And the other question I want to ask you is, doesn't God already know what you've done? And the answer is God knows exactly where you are. God knows exactly where you've been. And God knows exactly what you've done. And every single one of us in the room, He knows everything we've done. And yet He still comes down and says, where are you? I want to have relationship. I want to have relationship with you. Isn't that profound? Did I say that that was the fourth point? My creator seeks relationships. I have a creator, number one. My creator turns chaos into order, darkness into light. When my creator changes things, he calls them very good. And then my creator doesn't just leave me. He comes searching for me, even though it should be the other way around. He comes searching for me because he's looking for relationship. And then the fifth and last one is this. God makes a promise. There's this crazy little verse in the cursing of the serpent in Genesis 3. I've lost it now. Let me go back there. So God curses the serpent and he 
says this little thing, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Another translation there uses the word crush. He will crush your head and you will bruise his heel. Now this is not a story about going to the Karoo and being afraid of snakes. Right? It's got nothing to do with being fearful of snakes. This little passage is what theologians call the, the proto-evangelium. It's the first time in this whole of scripture that the gospel is promised. In that moment where God is cursing the serpent, he is declaring a promise that there's one coming through the line of a woman, Jesus, who would crush the head of the serpent, the devil, think about the cross, and that his heel would be bruised. Think about Jesus being killed. This is the first, the first declaration of the gospel. And where is it, guys? It's in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, right after men and women have said, we do not want you. Thank you very much, God. We're going to live in our story. We're going to self-determine what is truth anyway. We will make our own truth. And in that moment, God, the Father, begins to prophesy about a coming Messiah, Jesus Christ. Doesn't this make you excited? Can I have anyone charismatic in the room say amen? amen. Can anybody say yes? Thank you, Jesus. I mean, this is incredible. He's making a promise that it will not stay this way. He's declaring cosmic warfare. And you go to Romans 16 and verse 20, and this is what Paul writes to the Romans. He says, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The gospel in our lives, how God even in our lives comes and crushes, which is a reference back to Genesis 3, 15. And right there, God is declaring, good news, Messiah incoming. So this is what I want us to leave this morning with. I have a creator. God saying, I get you, I made you, I designed you, I understand how you were made to live. Guys, this flows into the most practical aspects of our life. Jacobus, what God has designed you to do for your career is designed. It's not an accident that someone phoned you and you networked with somebody else. Batesy started his new job this Monday. Can we have a woohoo? Un unbelievable. Four days unemployed. It's the work of God networking. It's God saying, this is what I have purposed and planned for your life. Which is why we can step into it so confidently without having relational nonsense going on. Because actually, God's purposed our lives. I have a creator. My creator changes chaos. Yes, in the cosmic light to darkness. That's like the, the, the most incredible sign of God's power. And then you say, God, if you can do that, can you help me? Can you work here in me? Show me again your glory. The heavens declare the glory of God. And then when he does, oh my goodness, it's so unbelievably beautiful that the words very good don't even come close. I love watching change in people's lives. I love watching it's the same for me as watching the autumn leaves beginning in Stellenbosch. Isn't it glorious? It's the same as sitting up in that field just now and having that panoramic view. I don't know why they've built their houses down here. There's like such a nice spot up top there where you've got like these, the whole mountain views. It's glorious. And these things are awakening us to God's beauty in our lives. It's very good. And even when you turn from me, still I will pursue you. This is what I want you to leave with today. Still, I'm pursuing you. I want relationship with you. You are mine. Personal relationship. And then the last one is that I've made a promise that I have kept. Genesis is pointing forward. There will come one through the seed of a woman. There will come. We are now looking back saying there has come. And there will be a glorious return where there's no more injustice, where there's no more sin, where there's no more brokenness, there's no more fighting in the congregation, there's no more, you know, that pastor goes on so long. We sang the chorus 20 times. Guys, 20 times is nothing. In heaven we're going to sing, holy, 
Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is to come and we're going to sing it forever. So get used to singing choruses a lot of times. She doesn't like that aspect of heaven, obviously. And this is the promise where you keep misaligning yourself. I know how to realign you. Where you keep getting broken to pieces against the rocks of life. I know how to love you into healing and wholeness. Where you are so confused by life and decisions and even why you were born and disappointments. God is saying, I hold the manual. I hold the operating manual. I know what you need. Okay, now I'm really finishing now. Do you seek pleasure and satisfaction? God put that in us. God put it in us. Every single one of us want the full life. Every one of us wants to be fully human is a great phrase for that. But what I'm here to tell you again this morning is that Jesus is the full pleasure. He is the supreme satisfaction. He is the only true story. And if you really are struggling to believe me, please can I ask you practically go and ask some people. Go find a wealthy person and ask them, did you find it in wealth? Go and find a person who's put it in celebrity and fame and ask them, when you got to the top, when you got to the fame that you were hoping for and the number of Instagram followers that you were hoping for, whatever it is that your goal is, did it satisfy? Ask the, the parent who's pegged their hopes on their children and on their family life. The, even these good things, these are God gifts to us. All of these things are good things, but they do not satisfy in and of themselves. Jesus is the supreme pleasure. Do you seek purpose and meaning in your life? These are the words of Jesus. I have come that you may have life and have it in abundance. Have it to the full. Like He wants us to live good lives. He wants us to live full, God-honoring, joyful, celebration lives in the midst of pain and brokenness and everything it means to be human, but yet to be able to say, I'm fully human in Jesus. Isn't that profound? Are you seeking truth? Jesus comes and says, I am the way. I am the truth. No one can come to the Father except through me. Jesus, as we close this morning, I just want to pray over us and over the next few weeks as we speak about the true story that starts right here in the book of Genesis. And I want to pray that your spirit would brood over our minds. Teach us, God. Show us what you've actually written for us to read, that we can, that we can grasp it and understand it, Lord. And then don't just leave it in our minds, but help us press it into our hearts by the power of the Spirit. Come and make it come alive, even this morning as people are leaving. Lord, I just want to ask that your Spirit would come and make this Word come alive. Let hope come alive in our hearts. Those who are desperate and down and, and doubting and depressed this morning, would they know there's another story? Come and fill our hearts, Lord. Those of us who are seeking so hard after earthly pleasures and we're distracted chasing after wealth or we're distracted chasing after the perfect family or the perfect spouse or the perfect student career, whatever it might be, Father, would you come and teach us that you alone satisfy, but not in our minds, in our hearts, God. Let us know that we know that we know that our God is the satisfier, is the one in whom we can find pleasure, true pleasure. And then, Father, let it come out of our hands. Speak of obedience. We want to live like this. Lord, there's changes that need to happen in my life, in Kate's in my life, in our family. There's things that need to change. And I know that's true of every heart sitting in this room today. We've forgotten. We've got distracted. Something else has been the burning light in front of us. And we want to ask you, come and let us obey. Give us grace by the power of the Holy Spirit to obey you. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, it is wonderful to be together. Bates is going to lead us quickly in communion together. And then we're going to have some Buddha coffee and boiky pot and tea and kebabs. <laughs> this is the last part of the sermon. Eh? Yeah. Guys, we're going to celebrate now with communion. And just so cool, 
how we get to reflect on that moment where Jesus' heel was bruised, but he crushed the head of Satan. And this is a moment we do, and we do it weekly, that we get to celebrate and remind ourselves that we get to live in that incredible victory <laughs> that God spoke about thousands of years ago. So let's get up, and it might take a while, and just grab a little um, juice and a bread, go back to your seats, and share it with uh, two or three people around you, just uh, praying and reflecting and reminding ourselves and thanking Jesus for his death and resurrection on our behalf. Okay, go for it. Thank you, Jesus. For being together, thank you for your death and your resurrection on our behalf. Thank you for our time to worship you together. We praise you, Jesus. You are so good. Let's have an awesome afternoon together, and we'll be back here next month. Same venue, next month we'll be together. Awesome. Have a great Sunday, everybody.